Hi, this is Deb. I'm the Traveling Stocking Stitcher. This is my floss tube channel where I talk about cross stitch. And I'm calling this episode, this time I really effed up my stitching because I went from an FO to an FFO. Not once, but three times. I took a finished object and made it a fully finished object. And here they are behind me. They are the John Clayton International pieces that I have done of places that I have visited. Now, when I first started my floss tube channel back in January 2022, more than two years ago, my first episode, I talked about how I wanted to do this, uh, or the idea that I had. I, I really didn't know exactly how I was going to do it, but should, I had the, the concept in my head of what I wanted to do. I remember it like it was yesterday. I'm not going to have, you know, ten of these things framed professionally. It's going to cost a fortune. So, lying in bed thinking, why am I stitching these if they're just going to sit in a pile somewhere and never go on my wall? And then, it came to me in the middle of the night. I added them up and four things from Switzerland in, in Italy. If I put them together, there's four of them, and they fit perfectly in a 16 by 20 horizontally. So, you know, like I said, they're about four and a half, uh, so that would fit the width of 20, and the 16, they're about 12 inches high, so you've got a couple of inches headway either one. So what I'm going to do is finish them with, uh, I've already ordered some backing, kind of a, uh, a map, kind of a, kind of a neutralish kind of a world map kind of thing. I'm going to use fabric to put it behind it and do it kind of like a flat fold, and then put these all on, you know, a flat fold kind of thing, and just paste them on the, the board um, and put them in the frame. And so I'll be able to do that. And then... I started thinking about Paris and London. Well, if I put those two side by side horizontally in a 11 by 14 frame, that's going to work too. So I'll be able to do that with, you know, I'll be able to do from Spain and Portugal one I'm going to do next, I'll show you. I'll have the two of those, I'll have two of the Paris and London, and then I'll have the four across from uh, Switzerland and Italy. So I'm very, very excited about that. I really, I can't tell you how excited I was about that. All right, so, so that was my idea. And I uh, wasn't exactly 100% sure all of the techniques I was going to use to accomplish it. So if you wanted to do something like this to mount several pieces in a single frame, um, I'll go through the process with you and uh, show you what it was I, I tried and did. Um, I don't know that I've seen anybody else do this technique. I borrowed some pieces uh, from other people of things, but I've used a few techniques that are... Um, as far as I know, I've not seen other people do. So I wouldn't call it a tutorial so much as uh, a document of the process I went through, things that I tried, things that worked, things that didn't work, um, and give you suggestions. So if you wanted to, to do this yourself, um, what you might want to do and what the pit, some of the pitfalls are and what some of the things that work well for me are. So I will show you that. I also have some whips that I'm working on. I'll show you my regular process on that. And then I'll take these guys down and, and show you what they look like. So here's my piece. I've got it set here and what I did was uh, cut some mat boards that were about a half an inch larger all the way around. And so I'll set my piece on here and just take a look at how it fits and make sure everything looks like I want it to. Next, I wanted to add some batting between the mat board and the finished piece. So I got some medium loft batting and clipped it down with the bunder clips. I found this was really helpful. Usually I just try to position it over the top and hold on and freeform cut it. This helped me do a much cleaner edge. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's nice to have a clean edge on it. Now it's time to assemble the piece, so I put down the board, place the batting on top of that, and the finished piece on top of that. I did try to use the Wonder Clips on this, but it left indentations, so I wasn't able to use those. I ended up having to iron those back out again. Then I gave the piece a final pressing, and I used Mary Ellen's Best Pressed Spray. helps get out some of the wrinkles. And ironed up the piece to get all the marks out. I'll do a little measuring to make sure I've got the, the edges looking good and kind of eyeball it, make sure it looks good. And then what I'll do is I'll tape down uh, lightly with masking tape, kind of tape it down almost like you're uh, wrapping a gift. Do the corners uh, the same way you would when you're using gift wrap. 
Now the masking tape is just temporary, so it doesn't have to be real tight. I'm just going to hold it in place while I glue things down, and I'll remove the tape as I go along. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't want to pull it too tight because then it's going dis to distort the stitching and pull the edges out of alignment, uh, making them not look straight. So uh, just, like I say, just loosely tape it down, um, and we'll flip it over, and you can kind of scoosh it around a little bit. And I'll measure it again before I do the actual gluing. Don't worry too much about the corners if they don't look real sharp and pointy. I'll show you how to tighten those up later. One thing I discovered in this process, that it's actually better to use millimeters than inches. I'm not really measuring things, I'm just trying to make sure that things are even on either side. So it's more accurate because there's smaller increments in millimeters, and you also don't have to worry about the fractions in the math. So I'd rather count one, two, three millimeters than having it be three-eighths on one side and half-inch on another side and have to do the math to figure out how much I have to move it left or right. And if I've made any changes based on my measuring and how things look, I can always just turn it back over and reposition the, the masking tape a little bit to adjust it appropriately. Now I'll start to glue down the fabric, and I'll just lift a little bit of the masking tape up and put a little dot of glue on here just to kind of get it in place for starters. Check the front, make sure everything still looks good, and then I can continue on with uh, pulling back more pieces of the masking tape and doing more thorough gluing along the whole edge. When I get to the corners, I'll just peel back the tape and put a little dab of glue in the corner. Um, might even need to trim it up a little bit if it seems like it's too much excess fabric. And then just glue it down like, again, you would uh, for a gift. Now we're going to tackle those corners. This is something I learned from Helen D's uh, Floss Tube Extra called Cross Stitch Flat Finishing Tutorial from three years ago. I'll put the link down below. You see these corners look a little uh, little loose, and we will tighten those up. So I'll just take some uh, close in color floss and take off a, a piece here and enough to do. I'm going to do a loop start. I'm not even going to tie a knot in it. So I'm going to double up my thread, and I don't know, maybe a foot long, and I will thread my needle, just regular stitching needle, and I will go in just like I'm doing a loop start and go through about maybe an inch away from the corner and go down through the fabric and then up and through the loop and then go back down through the hole again just like I'm starting a loop start in if I were stitching and then I will just uh, once that's anchored down just keep stitching it and going from one side to the other, pulling it tight, not overly tight, and so I'll go from the right to the through to the left and pull it up and do a couple of stitches like that until I get close to the top and within a couple of stitches to the top. Then I'm going to go from underneath and pull it up through the top. I find this makes a tighter connection and then I'll go underneath over on the other side and pull it out the front and pull it through and then go back over to the other side under the right underneath the fabric pull it up the top and continue to do that until you get up to the corner and one more in there can probably fit one more in there and I'll flip it over once I get as close as I can to the top and take a look at make sure it looks okay. You don't want it to, to show through to the front, obviously. And 
and then I'll just come through from the top left, or right to left, and flip it over and take a look and see how it looks on the right, and put my final stitch in there in the corner, and then I'll just come back kind of the same way I started out and work my way back down away from the corner by going through both sides down from the top up through the bottom of the one side and pull it out again and then I'll tie a knot times and cut our thread and flip it over and take a look and see how how it looks now you can see obviously the difference between the finished one and the non-finished corner now for the larger frame I found a picture that was in it and it was mounted on cardboard and I took it out and this is one of my attempts that ended up uh, happened to be scrapped so um, but I'm going to show you what I did I, I, I thought maybe I could reuse the picture without having to cut a separate mat board and I would just mount it on the back of this particular picture but because I was planning to use the cardboard I was concerned about the corrugation showing ridges and also maybe the color showing through because the fabric was not particularly thick fabric so I decided to use some iron-on interfacing um, and this also did not go well um, if you don't need to use it I don't know that I would recommend that you use it and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute I cut my fabric uh, about a couple of inches all the way around wider than the backing mat board which was turned out to be uh, very important to do that and I also cut the interfacing to match the same size and then I ironed up the fabric to make sure it was all smooth before I applied the interfacing I turned my fabric over so I've got the right side facing down and then I placed the interfacing over the top of that um, you can kind of see it's kind of a bumpy sided which is the glue side so you want to make sure that that is facing the back side of your fabric because that's the heat will release the glue and attach it to the fabric so I've got that position there and what you want to do is take like a wet dish towel and kind of soak it and wring it out um, and then you will press it with a, a hot iron lay the wet dish towel completely over the piece and make sure everything looks like it's flattened out and then you want to I started in the middle and you just want to take a hot iron and hold it for about 10 to 15 seconds in one pos position you don't want to slide it around or move it um, you just want to hold it and press it and then release it pick it right up and then move it over to the next spot and do the same thing and continue to do that work your way around the piece and I would check occasionally to make sure that it was doing what it needed to do and not be wrinkled etc now I'm not sure why if it's because it was such a large piece of fabric and a large piece of interfacing but I discovered uh, later when I went to apply the stitching onto the piece that in some places the corners did not stay real tight on the fabric so I ended up having to use some glue as well and once I finished ironing the back I flipped it over and just smoothed out I was real careful because it was easy to put wrinkles back into it um, that I would just kind of just gently press out anything that I saw that was uh, maybe had some creases in the interfacing and make sure that I pressed those out next it was time to attach the fabric onto the backing board for the frame on the smaller frames I was 
able to find some sticky board that I could use as a backer board. And I know people don't like to use this to apply the, their stitching directly onto the sticky board, but it worked really well for me to apply the fabric with the interfacing on it onto the sticky board to provide the background before I put the stitching down. I just peeled off the backing to reveal the adhesive and then I took my fabric and laid that down face down on and was able to position the board right on top of that with the overlap on all sides. Then I flipped it over and just pressed it down starting from the middle and working my way out pressing it smoothing it out from the middle and getting out any air bubbles or wrinkles and smoothing it out. It gave it a nice smooth wrinkle free appearance. Then I just took my frame and popped the backer board into the inside of that and pressed it down. By having the little overlap on all the edges it enabled me to be able to pull tight, particularly in places where the interfacing was not staying real tight and it allowed me to be able to to pull the, the gaps out if there were any in, the, in place. For the larger frame that didn't have the adhesive backing I was going to use the cardboard and use Mod Podge. It's a non-toxic glue and I was going to use that to apply the fabric with the interfacing directly onto the cardboard. Again, hoping that the interfacing would prevent the cardboard from showing through and showing any ridges in the corrugation. I used a foam brush to apply the Mod Podge onto the backing board and uh, put it all on in a, a a fairly light even coat. Once I got the back completely coated then I was able to put the fabric down and press it out again working from the center outward and leaving overlap on all sides. And you can see this is where I discover that the interfacing may not have stayed on as tightly as I would have hoped to. So I used some Mod Podge to apply it to the fabric. And I put it on directly on the fabric to try to, to get it to adhere to the interfacing. Again, I'm not sure if it was because such a large piece that the ironing didn't do it or if I didn't iron it effectively, but um, I did end up using some Mod Podge to try to hold it down. Once I got the Mod Podge all pressed out, now it's time to put some books on it to weigh it down and help it to dry and also hope that the cardboard did not curl up. So the smaller frames with sticky board worked fine. However, the larger frame using the cardboard did not work well. Not only did the cardboard bow, and the interfacing did not stick well to the fabric. But against my better judgment, I also trimmed the edges of the fabric to right to the edge of the board, and that didn't leave me any ability to pull the fabric tight once it was in the frame. So the lesson learned in this experience is I should have used a piece of wood uh, for the backing board which I ended up doing anyway. This would have eliminated the need to even use the interfacing. My only concern was the ridges in the cardboard and maybe seeing the brown through the back. Um, might still want to use the interfacing if I had a, a real sheer fabric and was worried about the color showing through. Um, but the other thing I would have done differently instead of using the Mod Podge, I would use um, the spray adhesive, the tacky glue to hold down the fabric and uh, that would have eliminated a couple of steps as well so it would have made it actually easier. I, I did have a moment of panic because the fabric that I was using uh, when I first bought it was out of stock 
when I first tried to order it, and I ordered it from a different shop on Etsy, and they only had one piece left. Fortunately, by the time I got around to uh, doing the framing and realized I had a problem, I was able to find another piece on Etsy that I was able to buy and be able to redo this using a piece of wood board. To attach the stitching, I thought Velcro would be a good idea. Now, I've used some pretty heavy-duty Velcro that we had, and you might not... I, I'm a little concerned about taking them on and off. I don't intend to do that, but I do want something strong enough that's going to hold them in place. Um, but you could probably use a lighter Velcro if you're something you were going to switch out frequently. Another benefit of the thicker Velcro was because there was so much fabric on the back uh, wrapped around the, the mat board that I think it helped make better contact with the backing board. Now because this was fairly heavy duty Velcro, I didn't need a big piece. I just used a couple of squares, one near the top, one near the bottom, and glue gun those onto the back of the stitch piece and then the corresponding piece also onto the back of the fabric. Once everything was glued on, then I was able to position the pieces on the Velcro and I had uh, opportunity to adjust it just the way I wanted to without having to worry about them being glued on permanently. Got them down here and I'll show you what they look like close up. So these are um, Big Ben and uh, Paris, I think they're called John Clayton Internationals, and a close look at them. The fabric I chose is, it's hard to tell because you don't see as much of it as I thought, but I wanted something neutral, and I wanted it to have a travel theme, so it's kind of got these maps, and it's got a little bit of a gold glint to it, a sheen to it, and so that's what I used. I haven't stapled these in here yet because I kind of wanted to show you um, the back. Um, in the video I talked about um, how I had cut the, the edge too close and that was not a good thing so I am going to staple these on later. But I just wanted, I just got them finished up today and I wanted to show them to you as soon as possible. So this is what the frame looks like. And here is the big one. And the dimensions on these are, this is a 16 by 22 frame on the inside, and the outside is a 20, or 18 by 24. And one of the things that, uh, it took me a, well over a year, I think, to find the frames that I wanted to use. And I found the, the two um, vertical ones I, are, are the same frames, and this I found somewhere else. But what I liked about them is they almost, when they are next to each other, will be almost the same size, because I'm going to put the, the two verticals on either side of the horizontal one. So they're almost the same size, and the profile is pretty close, and the, the wood itself is, is close in style. So. so this is the board that I had to have my husband cut, because the cardboard that I was using was not working. But you can kind of see... Here they all are stuck on there um, with the Velcro. And these are the order of the things that we put them in. But I just was really concerned about getting them on there because once you glue something on, it's there. And getting it back off again was my concern. So the Velcro gives me a little more peace of mind. Um, I can move them around if I want to. Not that I think I'm going to do that, but there they are. And then the last one I did was... Spain, so this is the Alhambra and Corsican Village, which is not in Spain, but it looked like Spain to me. So there's the other one. I'm quite happy with how those turned out. I do have one that I framed on its own. I did find a frame that would fit um, a John Clayton Interna International. Um, this is called Spanish Arch, and so I thought this one looked good with a single frame around it. But the others were all places that I had been together, so I wanted to group them together in frames. So, so some other John Clayton things, so now that I'm excited about doing this, um, I've got some others that I need to stitch and possibly use the same technique. But we've got uh, the Statue of Liberty, 
which is a possibility. Um, these all end up, I think, being about the same thing, although there is, I think, the, the Spanish ones are just about a half an inch. I don't know if you can tell. I can get them level. Yeah, you can see the Spanish ones are maybe about a half an inch longer than the others that I did, so I'm not quite sure why. I did them all in the same fabric, so the stitch count, I think, might is just a scooch longer. Width is exactly the same, so I'll have to check out the, the situation on sizes on these. I also have the Golden Gate Bridge. And I have Tulip Fields. These are from Heritage Crafts. You can see in the corner is the folks that put them out. It's a British company. And some places I haven't visited yet, but hope to someday. I've been to Germany, but I have not been to the new one Schwein Castle, Mad Ludwig's Castle, but that looks very pretty. So I'm excited to do that one and maybe have to go ahead. And then finally we have Greek Steps. So, All right, let's take a look at my whips now. Um, all of these are French related because I'm going to do an episode all about France. And so uh, I have been working on that. And the first one I have is called Medieval Fleur de Lis. It's by the Vivsters. Vivienne Powers is the designer. And um, it's also on the Etsy shop. It's called Cross, uh, Cross Stitch Christmas Medieval Fleur de Lis Cushion. And I'd shown this before. This is, the colors are from a floor tile I'd seen in the um, Church of Saint-Chapelle in Paris. And I wanted to recreate the colors. I think she changed the colors to make them more Christmassy, based on the, the title on Etsy. Um, but I wanted to recreate the actual colors. So this is what I did. And even though it's done, I'm thinking I'm going to frog the, the reds. Because I was so worried about the blue. I ordered a bunch of blue. I'm doing them in sulky. This is done on a 32 count um, black uh, Lugana from Swigert. And... Once I, the blue is the very last thing I stitched, and once I got that in, I started realizing the reds don't look like the tile. Um, so uh, I, I think I'm going to switch it out. Here's kind of more of an orangey color. It's a sulky, they don't have their names on them, I forget which color this one is. Um, but it's 1317. So I think I'm going to tear out, it's not that much. And actually this was really pretty easy to stitch on. One of the other things that I did on this is the floor tile um, is on the diagonal, and I really wanted to recreate that. I like the look, but one trying to stitch on a diagonal, the recharting of that would have been really difficult. Plus, it would be really, really wide because it ends up being almost twice as wide. Probably mathematically, it is equal to twice as because you're rotating the, the the square a quarter turn or whatever it would be. So, the other thing I did is I wanted it to have a gap on the, the middle here around between the circle and the outer square border and it wasn't like that it, it ran into that so I moved everything up a couple of inches and out a couple of inches but to do that then I had to rechart this to make sure it went further into the corners and then out to the to the edge so that took a, a little bit of work but I'm very pleased with how it turned out I didn't stitch any of the black and I really like the black on the gold um, if I wasn't trying to recreate the the blue or the, the color of the tile, I might have just left it with the gold and the black. Um, and I'll show you a little video here of a collage of pictures that I did um, that kind of shows the progress and you can kind of see how it ended up looking. So I'm thinking of frogging out that red and I'll put a name on the bottom. I haven't picked out a, a font yet, but maybe something medievalish because um, the, the church was built in the 1300s or something like that, or 1200s, or I forget, but but I'll have it sell at San Chapelle, and then it would be my, my travel poster, so that's coming along. My husband said don't bother frogging it. I think I need to do it because it bothers me, so. The next piece, I've also um, shown you this before, but this has got some progress to it as well. This is also another uh, Vivian Powers uh, from the Vivsters. This is called Parisian Window. This is on 18 count. Um, two over one, and I'm about 39, uh, yeah, 39.7% complete. So here it is. It's got, you know, the appearance of the Eiffel Tower in the background. There'll be this kind of lacy curtain that's in there. You can start to see some of the three-dimensional window box 
effect. I think that's kind of a cool look that she's got going on there. So that's what it looks like. So not a whole lot to say about this one. You've seen it before, and um, yeah. I've got a couple of two new starts that you haven't seen before. This one I don't have a tremendous amount done on it, but this is uh, from the Stony Creek Collection Landmarks Around the World, um, book number 353. And they've got a number of different places. They've got uh, Big Ben or Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame is the one I'm doing. They've got the Great Wall of China, the Sphinx. And then in the back, um, they have the uh, uh, windmill. So, so, like I say, Notre Dame over here is the one I am doing. And don't have a percentage for you because it's not in Pattern Keeper, it's in a book. So, what I've got so far, it's just kind of beigey and gray so far. So, that's all I got to say about that one. I've got another new start you haven't seen before. This one is uh, Notre Dame Gargoyle, I think it's probably called. It's um, from Cross Stitch World Art. They're a shop that's no longer on Etsy, so unfortunately I don't know if you can get it. Um, but I wanted to do this and figure out a way to eliminate some of the stitching, so I decided to do it on a 28-count uh, Gothic Lugana 2 over 2. And by not stitching the sky, I have eliminated um, at least 5,000 stitches. And maybe even more. I'm not certain. There's some some um, color along the the skyline or the um, on the horizon, little purples and stuff that I think I'm going to leave off as well because I think it wouldn't look right. Uh, but this was what I've got so far. Um, without doing the sky, I'm about 61.6 percent of what the entire finished piece would be. For just the things that I'm stitching at, I've um, about 41 percent. So this. And I'm really quite pleased with how it's looking. I'm enjoying stitching on this one as well. So I've got the outline of the gargoyle, and boy, the fabric is even showing prettier on on camera. So he's looking out there. There will be an Eiffel Tower mm, over here somewhere that he's kind of looking down over Paris, and there'll be a bunch of buildings. I'll show you the picture of what it looks like, and I'll say Paris across the bottom, of course. So. And then I have my ongoing Chatelaine that I've been working on for a while. And I haven't done a ton of work on this lately, but this, um, I've done a little bit more since the last time you've seen it and gotten that corner done a little bit uh, down in the lower, lower corner down there. I've done a little extra piece, but um, this is what my Venice Mandala Chatelaine looks like. And, I don't know, as long as we're talking about chatelines, I will show you the uh, framing that I did of my Mini Mystery Mandala 03 chatelaine. And as long as I was working on these guys, I figured I may as well finish this one off as well. I finally found a frame for it. And a couple of weeks ago, I put a little floss tube extra three minute video out about this um, to commemorate hashtag Chatelaine Wednesdays. This is a hashtag that um, Amy from Fiber Arts Amy, who has a floss tube channel, and Maggie from Kitchy Whips also has a floss tube channel. They have been supporting this, this um, to encourage people to do more chatelaines and to take some of the intimidation and fear of chatelaines. So they wanted people to support and post to that. So as long as I got this framed up, I figured I'd do a video, but I will show you here as well. So this is found a nice gold frame that I wanted to bling it up with here and so yeah there it is thanks for watching today it's so good to have you here with me I hope you enjoyed the video and learned uh, maybe some new techniques that you could try out yourself and if you liked go ahead and like it. If you uh, want to subscribe, if you haven't done that already, that'd be great. Leave me a comment. I would appreciate that as well. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining me. Bye.